The local government news roundup is proudly supported by Davidson. For 30 years, Davidson has been strengthening the local government sector by identifying and providing the people, expertise and experience that local government needs to enhance its capability, productivity and performance. Davidson is nationally recognised for its executive recruitment services and over the past four years has built a business advisory practice rapidly evolving into one of the nation's foremost and trusted local government business consultancy firms. The Davidson methodology and approach is simple. Thinking beyond now and aiming to be a valued partner with your local government, not just for the immediate project, but for the next 30 years. Speak to Justin Hanney or Seamus Scanlon to find out more or head to davidsonwp.com.au. Davidson, your future, your partner. Just ahead on the Local Government News Roundup, council frustrations with suburban rail loop planning, integrity concerns raised over grant funding at two Melbourne councils, a critical waste management issue in Sydney, New South Wales housing reforms delayed, Townsville's mayor returns to work prompting renewed calls for his resignation, challenges for UK councils running polling booths for the country's snap general election, and the New Zealand Council that says it's saving $3,000 a day on road construction projects. I'll tell you how just ahead on the Local Government News Roundup. Hello, I'm Chris Eddy. Welcome to the Local Government News Roundup for Friday the 5th of July 2024. Also in this episode, Greater Geelong's Mayor to visit South Korea, alarming figures from a police blitz on family violence offences, and three Kiama councillors respond after being referred to ICAC by their council CEO. The podcast is brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association, conducting a comprehensive study of over 600 councillors across Victoria with the 2024 Victorian Councillor Census. And we're supported by Davidson Search and Advisory Services, presenting an AI summit for the local government C-suite at Perigian Beach in Queensland in September. Three Melbourne councils, Monash, Whitehorse and Kingston, have expressed their frustrations with the lack of detailed information and involvement in planning for high-rise developments around the new suburban rail loop stations. The Age has reported on concerns about projected population growth, funding for essential infrastructure and the transparency of the SRLA's planning process. The Suburban Rail Loop Authority said detailed technical information had been shared with councils who have been actively involved in the process. But the councils feel their feedback has not been adequately incorporated and they're demanding more collaboration and clarity on the plans. The state opposition accused the Premier of pushing ahead with Suburban Rail Loop by shutting out local councils and silencing the local community's voice. Accusations of vote buying have been made towards Yarra City Council after a last minute decision to increase a grant to the Vietnamese community from $50,000 to $350,000. The Herald Sun reported an amendment was proposed by Greens Councillor Sophie Wade with minimal notice and without detailed costings or reasons. The decision has been criticised for a lack of transparency and public consultation, prompting suggestions of a sweetener for votes at the October elections. But the council says the money will go towards an enduring commemoration to mark next year's 50th anniversary of the arrival of Vietnamese people in Australia. Integrity concerns have also been raised at the city of Kingston after the awarding of a grant to a religious organisation against the advice of a councillor assessment panel. The Age has reported that $75,000 was awarded to the Druze Community Charity of Victoria, of which one councillor, Hardy Saab, is an executive committee member. Councillor Saab declared a conflict of interest and was not in the chamber for the vote on the grant's allocations. Two councillors, Georgina Oxley and David Eden, have raised probity concerns, but Mayor Jenna Davy byrne said the process of awarding the grants was in line with audit office advice. She told The Age that she was extremely disappointed that the integrity of the council had been called into question. Two other community groups also received funding against the original councillor panel recommendations. 
Stonington Council has extended a hotel's outdoor dining permit for 12 months against the advice of officers. The outdoor dining area at the Wolf Windsor on Eastbourne Street was set up during the pandemic and the Age reports it has attracted 35 complaints to the council in the past 12 months alone. The owner of the establishment says the complaints about noise, rubbish, drinking and drug activity and other antisocial behaviours are spurious. The council's decision to extend the permit includes conditions such as improved lighting, CCTV and a cap on patron numbers. Greater Geelong's Mayor Trent Sullivan will visit Changwong, South Korea to advance agreements under a Memorandum of Understanding and explore business opportunities. The visit aims to foster investment in Geelong and strengthen ties with Changwon's key industries, including manufacturing and technology. Meetings will focus on partnerships with Changwon National University, hydrogen fuel infrastructure and urban planning strategies. The council said the cost of the trip will be limited to economy airfares for the mayor and the CEO, with the hosts covering accommodation and other expenses. Hepburn Shire Council is seeking community input on its financial vision through a new survey, aiming to address financial challenges exacerbated by rising costs and natural disaster recovery. The council plans to make significant budget savings and explore additional revenue options to ensure long-term financial sustainability. Community feedback will help shape service delivery, infrastructure priorities and potential rate adjustments. Victoria Police has revealed the results of a five-month blitz targeting domestic violence offenders in Melbourne's southeast. They show that the LGAs of Casey, Frankston, Cardinia, Greater Dandenong and Mornington Peninsula accounted for more than 70% of family violence incidents across the region. Police arrested 2,700 individuals and laid 7,500 charges during the operation, according to a report from The Guardian. And the Victorian Legislative Council Economy and Infrastructure Committee has published an update on its inquiry into the adequacy of funding and service delivery by local councils. The first public hearing in Melbourne featured testimonies from various stakeholders, including the MAV, the VLGA, Rural Councils Victoria and FinPro. Key issues discussed included the financial sustainability of councils, the need for clear definitions of council roles and the impact of cost shifting from state and federal governments. The inquiry aims to explore alternative funding models and ensure local governments have a role in shaping policy. More Victorian news in brief. New digital tourism and community information kiosks have been launched in Neerham South and Yarragon providing 24-7 real-time information on local attractions, dining and accommodations. The hubs are supported by a partnership between Borbor Shire Council, Neerham District Community Bank and a state government grant. Depending on their success, more kiosks may be installed in other towns across Borbor Shire. The state government has unveiled designs for a new road bridge over the Werribee line at Maidstone Street, Altona to remove a dangerous level crossing. Construction will start next year with completion by 2027. The government is targeting the removal of 110 level crossings by 2030, with 80 already gone. La Trobe City Council has refreshed its 20-year-old corporate brand to enhance recognition and reflect a modern progressive image. The updated logo retains the iconic wave with a modern twist, symbolising the region's land, energy and future. The refresh was completed in-house. Signage and materials will be gradually updated within existing budgets. Before I move on to the National Roundup, here's an event you might like to bookmark. IBAC will hold a webinar on the 24th of July addressing corruption risks for interface councils in the lead-up to the October elections. The event will cover risks such as conflicts of interest, misuse of information, improper influence and procurement vulnerabilities. The free event is for local government and Victorian public service employees. You'll find a link in the show notes if you'd like to know more. Time to look at news from around the country here on the Local Government News Roundup, brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association with support from Davidson. And The Guardian reported this week that Sydney is facing a critical issue with its waste disposal infrastructure. It's running out of landfill space and relies heavily on ageing rail tracks to transport waste to regional sites. 
Experts are warning that disruptions to the rail services, particularly due to flooding, could lead to uncollected garbage piling up in hospitals and businesses. The New South Wales Environmental Protection Agency projects landfill capacity will fall short by 2030 and the Committee for Sydney is urging better planning and investment in waste infrastructure to prevent future crises. The New South Wales state government has delayed the second stage of its housing reforms until after the council elections in September, according to a report from the Sydney Morning Herald. The delayed reforms include allowing more terraces, townhouses and small apartment blocks near transport hubs and town centres. The reforms were initially intended to be fully implemented by June this year and they aim to deliver up to 112,000 additional homes over five years. Three Kiama councillors referred to the Independent Commission Against Corruption by their council's chief executive have denied any wrongdoing. The referral is related to a development application for a micro abattoir. Councillor Karen Renkima Lang expressed shock at the referral, learning of it through local media, and she suggested it may be politically motivated. ABC News reported that Greens councillors Cathy Rice and Jody Keast are the other councillors caught up in the matter, which is unlikely to be resolved before the upcoming elections. Parramatta's CBD businesses can now apply to operate 24-7 under new late-night trading development controls promoting a vibrant nighttime economy. The controls offer better hours, longer trial periods and greater clarity and are aimed at positioning Parramatta alongside global cities like New York and Paris. The Council expects the new controls to help attract new investments and boost the local economy. The City of Sydney is seeking creative design concepts for branding the Sydney New Year's Eve event, aiming for a bold, colourful and exciting visual identity that will be used for at least three years. It wants an original design that is instantly recognisable and reflects Sydney as a cultural and creative city. It has opened an EOI process with a deadline of July 26. To Queensland and Townsville Mayor Troy Thompson under pressure after a no-confidence vote and allegations of exaggerating his military credentials returned to work this week after a period of leave. The Townsville Bulletin reported that his first action was to ask the media to leave the council chamber, saying that they could watch it online. The so-called media ban has been condemned by politicians with more calls on the state government to step in and remove Mr Thompson from his position. Premier Stephen Miles said he was disappointed with the exclusion of the media from the meeting and repeated his call for the Mayor to step down during the current investigation. But the Council's acting CEO Joe McCabe has since said there was a misunderstanding about the Mayor's ruling on media in the Chamber. It's claimed he was requesting cameras and recording devices to be removed and that journalists could have remained present at the meeting. Mayor Thompson is under investigation by the Crime and Corruption Commission, which has no comment on its progress. The future of Norfolk Pines at Moffat Beach is uncertain as Sunshine Coast Council plans a foreshore revamp, including a rebuilt seawall to protect against climate change impacts. Sunshine Coast News reported that some locals fear the trees will be removed and they're demanding consultation and even suggesting they'll protest. The council has not ruled out removing the pines. Community feedback will be sought for landscaping behind the seawall and an independent consultant will be engaged for a geotechnical investigation. Time for the national briefs and long-serving New South Wales parliamentarian Richard Amory has received the key to Blacktown City for his significant contributions to infrastructure and public service. Serving 32 years in Parliament, including eight years as a minister, he's credited with improving facilities like Mount Druitt TAFE and Hospital. Prior to his political career, he was a police officer and actively involved in community organisations. Tasmanian coastal councils have locked in their budgets for the new financial year. CFM reported on the various rate increases, which include 5.9% at La Trobe Council and 7.1% at Kentish. Most other councils landed on increases between 4.5% and 6.5%, with Waratah Wynyard adopting the smallest increase of 2.95%. And the City of Fremantle will extend its trial of holding council meetings twice a month until the end of September. The trial, which began last October after the number of elected members was reduced from 13 to 11, aims to provide more preparation time and expedite decision-making on deferred items. Perth now reported that the council's numbers are expected to reduce even further next year.
The CEO and the Mayor of South Australia's city of Burnside have used a visit to Canberra for this week's National General Assembly to lobby for the reinstatement of federal funding for the Greater Adelaide Freight Bypass. The bypass would improve freight productivity, reduce traffic collisions and minimise noise and pollution by reducing the number of heavy vehicles on Portrush and Glen Osmond roads. Adelaide is unique among Australian capitals for having a major heavy vehicle route running through residential areas. Statistics show significant heavy vehicle traffic and related accidents in these areas. To Western Australia, there's been a change at the City of Gosnells Council following the resignation last week of Adam Hort, who was Deputy Mayor. Councillor Bally Singh has stepped into the position as one of the two highest polling unsuccessful candidates at the last election. The Council will decide on a new Deputy Mayor at a meeting next Tuesday. The Shire of Augusta Margaret River has won a legal case against Blue Whale Farm Plantation Proprietary Limited for illegally clearing 16 hectares of native bush in Scott River, which included endangered flora species. The magistrate ruled in favour of the Shire, highlighting the importance of environmental protection and adherence to development approvals. Shire President Julia Meldrum said the decision demonstrates the Shire's ongoing commitment to preserving biodiversity and the necessity of following regulations to prevent environmental destruction. And the City of South Perth has proposed a law to ban cats from 27 sensitive wildlife areas, including parks and school bushlands. Cats found in these areas will be seized and owners could face fines of up to $5,000. Similar laws already exist in other councils like Canning and Fremantle, according to Perth Now, and other councils such as Bayswater are also considering similar regulations. This is your Friday update from the Local Government News Roundup. It is the 5th of July and it's brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association with support from Davidson Search and Advisory. And time now for the Global Roundup. The UK general election is underway as I record this episode and some councils are dealing with challenges as they run polling booths. Two Scottish councils, Fife and the City of Edinburgh, have had to open emergency voting facilities for postal voters who didn't receive their ballots. It follows widespread issues with postal vote deliveries across Scotland, with some councils calling for a comprehensive review of the system after the election. BBC News has reported on the situation, which has been described by the First Minister as deeply unacceptable. Meanwhile, waste and recycling staff in half of Scotland's councils, including major cities like Edinburgh and Glasgow, have voted to strike over pay disputes. The unions, Unite and GMB, have rejected COSLA's pay offer, calling it insufficient. The strikes could start in two weeks, potentially affecting the Edinburgh Festival. In the US, Los Angeles City Council is considering a proposal to expand the city's Fair Work Week law to include around 50,000 fast food workers, aiming to provide more stable schedules and paid time off. The proposal includes mandatory paid training and additional paid time off for hours worked, and it has the support of the California Fast Food Workers Union. However, the LA Times reported that the move is facing opposition from industry groups concerned about the financial burden on small businesses already coping with a recent minimum wage increase. To Canada and Edmonton City Council has rejected proposed changes to its code of conduct that would have kept councillors' misdeeds private by default. The Edmonton Journal reported that the council unanimously voted to revise the bylaw, emphasising the need for transparency. Mayor Amajit Sohi and other councillors expressed concerns that keeping reports private would undermine public trust. The bylaw will be reviewed by a special council committee. And to New Zealand, Hamilton City Council Andrew Bidder is now facing 24 Code of Conduct complaints, a record number, following his profanity-laden submission to Waipa District Council. The Waikato Times reported that the complaints, including one from Hamilton's Mayor Paula Southgate, have prompted an independent investigation. Councillor Bidder claims he was acting as a private citizen and argues the submission falls outside Hamilton City Council's jurisdiction. Despite the criticism, he's refusing to resign from his position. And Carterton District Council in New Zealand claims it's saving up to $3,000 per day per job 
by temporarily closing roads instead of using stop-go traffic management. The approach has gained the support of the local government minister, Simeon Brown, and is said to result in higher quality work, reduced project time, improved safety and significant financial savings. While not suitable for all situations, the council claims it typically improves productivity by 40 to 50 per cent. And that's another episode of the Roundup in the Can. This one recorded Friday the 5th of July 2024. It's number 358. And it's all brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association with support from Davidson Search and Advisory. As always, links to the stories referenced and a transcript can be found at lgnewsroundup.com. The Local Government News Roundup is recorded in the city of Greater Geelong, Victoria, on the land of the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation. And I'll be back with more news very soon. Until next time, thanks for listening and bye for now.